Well, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Q. We're having Q conversations at our Palo Alto studio, getting off the road, uh, you know, getting ready for the holidays, a little bit of a break in the in the conference action, and we're excited to have our next guest, David Green. He's the CEO of Zero Stack. David, great to see you. Thank you. Good to be here, Jeff. So again, uh, for those who aren't that familiar with the company, give us kind of the quick and dirty on Zero Stack. So Zero, Zero Stack is a software company based here in Mountain View. We're building a new kind of private cloud infrastructure. The idea is to use automation to simplify operations while still keeping IT in control of that infrastructure. Really trying to deliver what a public cloud-like experience to users while keeping IT in charge and in control. It's funny, your, your website has been doing my background mm -hmm. work, self-driving private clouds, mm -hmm. like the autonomous private cloud. That's kind of what we're trying to get to, right? I mean, the, the idea is that, that, that too much of the work that IT has to do is bogged down in day-to-day -day administrative tasks and manual operations and kind of working with boxes. And, and instead, if we can start to bring automation and machine learning and intelligence there, IT can, uh, get, can move forward on right. the things that are more important and move faster, more importantly, and support the rest of the business. And, and, and Andy Jassy might argue with me, but I don't think he would necessarily, but you know, part of the, the genesis of public cloud was this friction between the dev and the ops, because yeah. they, you know, I'm, I'm on the hook, I have to, de to develop a new application, I don't have time to wait for the right. IT guy to right. provision right. me a new box, and I don't exactly know what kind of box, he's asking it's me questions, simple, Jeff. you know? it's, it's, it's a ticket you submit, yeah. and then in two it's weeks we'll get back to you, operating system, and, and then we'll get to the data. Right. And and you got to order it from Michael Dell, and it's coming in the mail. <laughs> um, so, so, so really it's that tension that probably right. really created the demand for a quickly provisioned, easy to provision, swipe my credit card and it just appears on my desktop. It so that's the piece of, of cloud that you're trying to emulate. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I think that's a good analogy, right? I mean, I think the, it's interesting, when you, when you go back to the origin of kind of DevOps, so the idea was that developers would take care of operations as part of building the application, as part of the application lifecycle. Right. In reality, I am yet to meet an application developer who has any interest Right. in operations, right. right? So really DevOps today is about how does the IT organization better support the development organizations and the application teams. Right. And, and just as in context, keep in mind that every organization today is becoming a software company because every customer interaction, every business process, every service delivery is somehow being instantiated in a piece of software right. that the organization's looking out toward, right? So when the business is driven by software and the developers need to move at the speed of the business, now how does IT keep up? And that's where this idea of IT being able to provide the kind of, that, that, that experience like you talked about, the, the swipe and go, right. be becomes so critical. Right, but at the same time, for all the reasons that have been well documented, there's just certain stuff that's not appropriate for, for public cloud. But what we're talking about is really has nothing to do with the appropriateness of whether it is or isn't. It's really trying to d to deliver the benefits of that type of a working model to whatever your infrastructure is. In the, in your case, it's private cloud. You know, it's exactly. my own data. It's exactly. my own infrastructure. Exactly. I, mean, I, I mean, I think it's important to acknowledge that I think there have been people in the industry who have said that the whole world was going to become public cloud. Right? I think our view is that that's not the case, and, and for as you say, for a variety of good reasons. I mean, there are, there are some really important external factors in the world right now that say that's not the case. Right. Uh, as you start to see the, the current political climate, the current geopolitical climate, you have more and more barriers going up around the world that says that you know my data shall be mine, shall remain in my country, it's not going anywhere else. Right. I mean, every time something rash or unexpected happens, I even know another set of customers in some European country saying my data will never leave this country. Right. Okay. Right. So that's one um, that's one external factor that says you got to keep control of your data and your workload, right? Uh, there's also a set of inter internal factors that says people are discovering that, as is always the case, it's much more expensive over time to rent than to own. You know, you have houses and you have hotels. You know, you don't live in a hotel, you use a hotel when you need it, you go live in your house. Right, right. right. And so as, as public cloud has spread and got more mature, people are realizing that there's a need to bring that home to better, better control the costs around that. And I think there's also a human dimension of this too, which is you, know, you, have an entire, you have an entire ecosystem of IT professionals with deep expertise, deep knowledge, um, that is only relevant and only applicable in a world that still has a notion of on-premises private cloud infrastructure. Right, right. Um, and you can be sure that those people are going to do their best to make sure that their, their livelihoods, their careers, their knowledge stays relevant. And so we see all those dimensions playing out in, in kind of as motivators for organizations to want a private cloud. Right. Um, now, the flip side's been it's typically been hard. Right. And I would argue that the, the appeal of public cloud's been the users like it, but it's easy. Right. Right. And so by trying to bring what we do with that self-service view and add an ease of operations around it, 
now IT can, can participate fully right. in this new ecosystem. Now it's interesting, right, obviously the incumbents are not just taking it lying down, no, and, right. and all the existing big infrastructure right, providers right, like right. Dell EMC and, and HP have been yeah. pitching, you know, hybrid cloud, or right, you know, they, right. they, they accept some stuff's going to be in the public cloud, yeah. but, you know, so they're also trying to put in place to make their infrastructure more cloud-like. So what are you guys doing differently than, say, what might be coming down the line from Dell EMC or coming down the line from, from HP, in terms of your customer's point of view? Well, I think, I think what's interesting is that we're going we're gonna to work with, with a Dell EMC or an HP or a Lenovo, whoever, as part of the infrastructure, right? Every cloud, at the end of the day, needs a set of compute resources, a set of storage resources, some networking resources, and those companies you've listed make excellent products in those areas, and we're going to use those and apply our software on top of it. I think where we see the bigger gaps around past cloud solutions has been around the software layer, right? And so look at some of the generations that have existed. You know, you have VMware as kind of the point of reference. You know, a VMware cloud, it's complicated. It's, it's, it's multiple products have been acquired over time, different architectures, different code bases, they don't integrate together, hard to hire people, they're expensive, they're hard to keep, those challenges. So what have we tried to do to make that better? Well, you've had, you had an, an, an open source alternative that came with OpenStack, okay? Right, right. Better software, lower cost software, but even more difficult to operate. At least that's the feedback we get from our customers, right? right? right. I, I love the idea of OpenStack, it's too hard to keep it running, okay? Uh, you've got a solution like Nutanix that says, I'm going to restrict your options. By restricting your options to just my world, I'm going to make it simple to operate. But people don't want those restrictions. People still want access, particularly developers want access, this very rich set of tools that are available out there and are only available in kind of more of an open world. Right. Um, and then of course you've got the ease of operations that the public cloud guys have done. So what we've tried to do is to take that same excellent base of infrastructure that you know the HPs and the Dells, the Lenovo's, whoever else provide, take that great foundation, then add software onto it that says, let's try and drive for the better software stack like you would have gotten with OpenStack. Let's try for software defined infrastructure like you would have gotten with Nutanix. Let's try for you know, automated operations like you would have gotten from a public cloud. Let's wrap machine learning around that to make sure that we're continuously monitoring the behavior of this cloud such that it can it can more effectively deliver what's right. required of it. So what does an engagement look like with a customer? Because obviously they've got this infrastructure, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, they they mm -hmm. want to get more cloud-like in, right, the, in right, the deployment right, of yeah. that and the in the accessibility, really. Yeah, yeah. Do they do they carve out a piece? Is it a greenfield project? Is it so, some percentage of, of, yeah. of allocation of their yeah. infrastructure? H I mean, how do they go about it? Because clearly, you know, stuff's up, it is right. running. There is, right. the, there is right. still the IT piece of right. keeping the lights on. Right. How do they carve it out? How, you know, kind of what is their, I don't want to say go to market, but their internal kind of project plan yeah. to start to bring this type of capability in-house? I mean, I think that the, it, it can, can take a variety of forms. I think that the driver of it typically is, is DevOps, right? There typically is a pain point that where IT isn't keeping up with its application developers, right? That's usually the catalyst and, for and the what's, project. And what's the screaming? The screaming bloody, I need help right now. The, the, kind the, the, of, the, the uh, scream bloody help I need right now is if I don't get my developers what they need more quickly, they're all going to Amazon. They're just going right, and 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 I'm not. They're not allowed to do that, and I am out of a job. And I'm trying to start stop okay. stop. The I'm, flight. I'm, I'm trying, trying to, to stop the, stop that knee jerk reaction okay. that says an Amazon's the answer. Right? Okay, but I can't because my current infrastructure is too hard, and I can't keep up with right, it. Right, okay? right. And so but that that's typically the catalyst is how do we bridge that gap? Okay. And then what well, we'll see kind of probably you know two use cases to to the examples you gave. Now one. It may be in the context of a new application being deployed. I'm, I, I'm going to deploy a new application. It is a cloud-based application. It needs a more flexible infrastructure. I don't want to put it on the stuff I have, which doesn't work. Right. Um, help me set up a new environment. That's the new use case. Same where we also see the, I have a set of applications running already. The infrastructure is on. It works, but it's expensive. It's cumbersome. It's complicated. Um, let me move some of those applications to zero stack as a better place in which to live and operate and be managed. Right. And we'll, we'll operate in both those models. So in some cases new infrastructure, some cases using what customers have. Okay, and then you, you, you've mentioned it a few times the mm -hmm. machine learning piece, mm -hmm. so a really important piece of this is not only the easy access and, and the easy kind yeah. of yeah. interface with the, with the infrastructure, but now you've got a different level of intelligence around the use of that, so I wonder, you know, are, are, are you seeing, um, you know, do you guys flag, oh my gosh, you, you not only have the cloud attributes of right. ease of use, but right. now you need a cloud attribute of a big explosion, you better get some POs in uh, we, with we Michael so and that. Meg. Exactly. So you do some of that, I mean, because it's obviously. Don't, don't, call, don't call Meg anymore. She's no, don't call Meg. Uh, Antonio, he's <laughs> a people on <laughs> We love Antonio. <laughs> I, mean, I think that is the answer, right? So, so machine learning, can, that's a great use case for machine learning in a cloud that says, hey, you know, given your current usage trends, this is when your resources are going to be consumed. Let us help you get more. Right. But uh, 
learning all machine learning is also helpful in how to get the most out of your infrastructure, right? right? You know, here are the resources people have said they needed versus what they're actually using. How do we better match what people are actually using right. to what's available and what's what's on what's on demand there, right? And over time starting to watch the behaviors in the system. These are the patterns we see of events. The the whole idea here is that is that there's too many tasks I said earlier that IT has had to do manually. And we want to be able to automate those tasks. We're not trying to eliminate jobs with automation, we're trying to eliminate tasks with automation. Right. right. Um, and machine learning really is the key that allows us to do that intelligently. Right. It's funny the whole jobs discussion because mm -hmm. on one hand all you hear about is the machines are taking all of our jobs, right, right. but then you just go to the go to the newspaper, or whatever's your favorite LinkedIn, and there's right. no shortage of job, right? right. There's, there's plenty right. of IT jobs, right. so right. they're not eliminating jobs; they're shifting jobs. I think they're even looking for truck drivers still, even though we're going to wipe out all the truck drivers <laughs> in a couple of years. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a different discussion. <laughs> that's a whole different, but, but a whole yeah. different <laughs> level of automation. Um, but it is it is interesting, and mm -hmm. and it is about getting people to do higher order work. Right. And as right. you said, right. IT is no longer about keeping the lights on; it is the business. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's not. It's not. It's about support. how do we grow with the business? How right. do we flex with the business? What's the right policy to support the business? And you know, that's not about configuring network addresses, right? Right. Let, let the machines do that. Right. Let the right. cloud do that. Let's figure out what our strategy should be for connecting with our users right. and how IT is going to enable that. So I'm curious if so. You've had some deployments. Mm -hmm, you've got mm -hmm. some early customers. Um, kind of unexpected, unexpected. Um, Results or you know, kind of second order impacts that you didn't necessarily expect or weren't that obvious yeah, that, that yeah. customers are starting to utilize by taking this approach to their hardware. Well, I think uh, so. A couple of things. Uh, one is uh, part of what we do is we provide this idea of a, of a workbench. We call it the DevOps workbench, which takes a, a set of leading DevOps tools, you know, Jenkins, Ansible, Hadoop, to make your choice, and makes those available really in one click down to the users. Um, what we've seen is people go very far in terms of linking together those tools to fully automate their deployments. So being able to literally software drive, software provisions the infrastructure, configures the application, deploys the application, spins it up, gets going. I have one, I have one service provider who's actually allowing users to go to a web portal, use a credit card, to order an application that they want to use, which then creates the VM, installs the application, runs the application, and makes it available to the user. So these these people just running with this idea of fully automated right. operations in a right. big way, right? Um, I think the second thing that's been interesting. So the IT guys are loving that, right? Like, right. like right. you're making them I mean, heroes. I'd, I'd my, my, for a very, <laughs> very large pharmaceutical company, the IT guy sat in the room with his DevOps peer and said, hey, the more he can do without me, the better. Right. And that's what we're trying to do, right? Um, the second learning I think though has been that there, there there's quite a few companies where I just say, I, I say it, they're tired, right? You've got people who have been struggling with these cloud infrastructure questions for years, and at this point they're like, you know what? I don't want to deal with it. And so we, we, we've had quite a bit of demand, and some of our big projects right now are actually in partnership with cloud service providers, with managed services providers, who have been kind of asked as a trusted advisor by their customers to come and say, build the next cloud for me. As an enterprise, I'm going to focus on the software, I'm going to focus on the applications, I'm going to focus on kind of managing my resources. You run it. Right. Um, and again, I think that opens up a new set of possibilities in terms of how IT can evolve and where they can focus going forward. And that's a really interesting kind of uh, underreported subset of mm -hmm. uh, probably new infrastructure providers where it is, it's kind of a private cloud managed by a service provider. Exactly. So I get the exactly. benefits of it. Yeah but I'm not having to run it. It's, and, and it's still undifferentiated heavy lifting in terms of my uh, core business. Yes, and, 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 and I add to that, all those things, and it's for someone you trust. Because right. most of the time we see is this, this, is a, this is a long trusted relationship. And so, you know, if you're going to go to the cloud and you're not going to run it, you want to be able to look somebody in the eye and know that they're taking care of your data and right. they're securing your information and they're taking care of your workloads and that you, 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 you can count on that, on that partnership yeah. that you've had. Well, I think it definitely supports the, uh, it's a multi-cloud world, right? It's a multi-cloud right? world, yes. <laughs> but, the, but the cloud benefits are still there, Absolutely. right? It's about yeah. being agile, it's about being fast, and it's yeah. like you said, it's about freeing up the devs to do dev and yes. not to do ops. Exactly, and <laughs> let, 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 let ops do ops and do it better and faster and easier than ever before, right. let the developers focus on the application. All right, well David, thanks for, uh, for taking a, minute, a few minutes and telling us all about Zero Stack. Appreciate it. He's David, I'm Jeff, you're watching theCUBE. We're in our Palo Alto studios for a CUBE conversation. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.